Hello? Okay. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for waiting. Um, and thank you for coming to hear about Chainer for uh, the very last tutorial of the day and the very last tutorial, in fact, of uh, SciPy, Euro SciPy 2018. So, um, let me start uh, just by getting a feeling of, uh, of who's in the room and what the experience level is. So who has used Chainer before? Wow, okay. Good. Uh, thank you for coming to a session that none of you ever used, for a product none of you ever used before. So um, Chainer is a framework. Uh, it's an AI framework, uh, a competitor with uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And um, I'll talk a little bit more in a second, but let me continue seeing who's in the room. So who has used one of the other frameworks, like um, TensorFlow or something like that? Okay, a good number of people, okay? And who has never used an AI framework or never done an AI from scratch, but has programmed something? Okay, so this is the first time. Okay, a fair number of you as well, welcome. So for those of you who have done uh, deep learning before, who have done a framework before, I hope that today's uh, tutorial will give you, a, first of all, a review of some of the basics. It'll show you why Chainer is the very best framework to use, of course, and also give you a good review of what it is that, uh, how deep learning fits together, what are the pieces of it, and hopefully a few tips that'll help you to do uh, better training as well. For those of you who haven't worked with a framework before, I hope that today's lesson will give you a good idea of how the various components of uh, deep learning frameworks fit together and how you can uh, chain them all together to make uh, a simple learning. So uh, as I mentioned on the preparation, there are no uh, downloads requirement for this. We're going to use Colab. Um, because Chainer uses the GPU for speed, uh, we can't use mBinder for it because that doesn't provide GPUs. It's CPU only. Um, so uh, if you could open now uh, the link uh, that's uh, in the preparation thing. Let's see. It's the um, Chainer Workshop, I believe, uh, and get the, uh, the Colab running. That would be a good idea just while I'm talking and going through other stuff. That's probably a good idea. So uh, let me say a bit about, uh, first of all, about Preferred Networks, the company that I work for. So. Uh, before I get into this, also for questions, uh, please feel free to ask me at any time when you have a question. Uh, as you might have heard from some of those sessions, if you have a question, probably somebody else does the same question. So feel free to let me know. So I work for Preferred Networks. Um, it's a really, really big name in the uh, neural network research area if you live in Japan, uh, which is where I live now. I'm, I'm American, but I live in Japan. I've been there for several years. Um, but it's less known outside of Japan. So I thought I would give you a bit of an introduction of the company. So we're doing uh, neural network research. Uh, we publish papers at uh, NIPS, ICLR, ICML. Uh, we, have, um, we focus on the industrial side of neural networks. So we do auto driving, uh, we do biochem, um, we do uh, training on manufacturing, so we work with FANUC. Uh, we have a partnership with Toyota. They've given us $100 million. Um, we also do a lot of work in speed as well. So um, there was a competition last year for who could do the processing for the ResNet data set the fastest. So ResNet is a very large data set, several uh, hundred gigabytes of data in it. The previous record was held by Facebook. Uh, they had done the ResNet training, uh, ImageNet training on ResNet in uh, one hour using 256 GPUs. Uh, we have our own cluster of GPUs, 1,024 GPUs, and uh, we were able to do the training straight linearly in 15 minutes. Uh, got a lot of press from that, and we gave a presentation on NIPS at it. And the other thing that we do is we make the open source uh, framework Chainer, which is what I'll talk about in a little bit later. It's um, nearly 100% Python. According to the GitHub, it's over 99% Python code. Um, the other frameworks that you'll see, the, the front of it might be Python, but usually they're using other languages behind it. So the benefit of having a fully Python language is that you really are able to go all the way into the details in it. So when an error happens, you can chase it all the way back. The errors are understandable, they're at runtime, and easily interpretable. And you can see how it's working underneath the hood. 
which gives a lot of ability for customization and makes it very straightforward. So, that didn't last long. So, but before I talk about Chainer, I wanted to talk about another product that we make. So uh, here at uh, EuroSciPy, I've been hearing a lot about people using NumPy. And something that's come up in a couple of the other sessions that I've been in is that it would be great if we could use the power of NumPy on a GPU. So uh, Chainer uses the GPU, and uh, we had a module within Chainer called KuPy that was doing all of the calculation. And we realized that there were people who would like to be doing NumPy-like calculations on the GPU, uh, but not necessarily doing deep learning, doing uh, distributional links, statistical things, other things. So we created a framework called KuPy, which basically is a drop-in replacement for NumPy that then will do all that calculation on the GPU instead. So the first, um, so the first uh, workbook that we have is the bit.ly.scipy-coupi. And uh, I'll just uh, talk about this briefly so you can see what it looks like and to show you the benefit of it. So if you ever need to do NumPy calculations on the GPU, you'll know what coupi is and where it's available. So this provides um, the ability, this is just basically how for the installation of coupi on Colabs. So, as I mentioned, I'm using the Google Colabs because they allow us to use a GPU, which makes the computation go much faster. And if you run this segment, you'll see some uh, running stuff going on there, and it will install it. So just so I can make sure see where people are, how many people have got that Colab open or are looking at it? Okay, great. And you've run the first thing as well? Good? Okay, a little bit less. Okay, go ahead and, and run the first thing. Uh, for this first part about Coupi, I'll go over it fairly quickly. The hands-on will focus on Chainer. So uh, the matrix madness. So Coupi especially uh, does the best in working with large matrices, which can be moved to the GPU to take advantage of the, the high parallelization available on a GPU. So you import time for uh, scorekeeping to see how long it takes, uh, NumPy and Coupi. And then we define basically a heavy matrix operation. Uh, for those of you who are, are familiar with uh, NumPy, I use XP as a, an abbreviation for either CuPy or NumPy because we'll use both in the same process. And then we make an A range of a certain size. We reshape it to 1,000 and minus 1. Uh, the minus 1 notation is maybe a little used. It just basically means figure it out from the other parameter. So if you have an A range of 6, reshape 3 comma negative 1, it's going to figure out, OK, it's 6, and we're reshaping to 3. The other dimension is going to be 2. So it basically just automatically does the remaining dimension for you. And then we take the transpose of it, and then we multiply it by 2 um, for all x's within the range. This is really heavy matrix calculation designed to test the performance. And then this one, we just do a, a test for it, where we compare the, uh, the coupi performance and see how fast it goes. We use both NumPy and CuPy and feed it through this routine to see how fast, it, how much the performance is. And the point is that we start out with a basically uh, 10,000, so 10 to the power of 4, which then is about 10,000 uh, iterations. And at 10,000 iterations, you see actually that uh, at this point, NumPy is faster. So you have some overhead to take your array and move it over to the GPU. And if it's not that big of a data, then NumPy is still going to be faster. It's better just to do it locally. But as we increase i within the range, and we get up more to uh, a million, uh, all the way up to, let's see, a trillion, then you can see that CuPy gets much faster. At the end of it, when we're talking about a trillion, NumPy has, takes about uh, 10 minutes to do the calculation, whereas CuPy just takes a minute and a bit. Yes? So there's, there's two things here we're seeing. There's the, the um, fixed rate of the overhead of moving over to the other, uh, the GPU. And that's what's giving the, the uh, CuPy the higher cost at the beginning and then makes it cost less later on. But the, the NumPy, you can see it, it basically it is scaling. Like, let's see, we're going from yeah, about up to 10, 5. Yeah, it's basically going up to linearly. 
but with CuPy, instead of going, it's, it's um, able to do more parallelization as it gets more calculations in. And so it's able to make more use of the GPU uh, to pay off of the overhead. Yes. So uh, a Kupai dot arrange does not create the pay step on the GPU. Kupai arrange uh, does create it on the GPU, and it takes longer, as my, to do that on the GPU as opposed to moving it up, moving right. on the. So it's so in the specific example, if I read it right, it's not an overhead of moving the pay step to the GPU. It's the correct. Of dot arrange. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Right, and so then for the, the next uh, test to show the, compare the difference, and this is uh, using k-means uh, check. So for this one, we're taking a look, and this is far too small to read, and I'm not going to go over it because I just want to mention this in passing. Um, the code is there on the, uh, the collab, and you can see that the, the time test for doing this k-means is that basically NumPy takes about 12 seconds, SciPy takes about 15 seconds, and um, I'm not sure about uh, where the overhead is coming in on that. That might be um, just basically from the frameworks. And Kupai takes about one-tenth of the time, a little less. So this is the benefit of working on the GPU, which allows for more parallelization. OK, that's the Kupai uh, intermission. Let me get to the meat of the matter. So this is, uh, this is the framework of Chainer. So this is uh, also your signpost as we go through this to see where we are and what we're talking about. Basically, when you're working with a, a framework for doing neural network training, you're going to be working, and we'll start from the inside, you're going to be working with data sets and models. And then the data set feeds into an iterator that then takes batches out of the data set and gets them ready to be processed. And then the model has an optimizer, which is stochastic gradient descent or um, Adam or Adagrad. And those are both put into an updater that puts them together and processes them. And then we have some extensions to do additional things that you want your neural network to do to see the performance, to see how the training is going. And all of that fits into a trainer, which puts it all together. So uh, now we'll talk about the details of that. So uh, please, if you haven't yet, uh, open the uh, collab for Trainer Workshop and uh, make a copy of it so that you're able to enter it, because I'll hopefully have enough time that you can take some exercises and uh, change the networks to see how different things perform. Okay, has everyone got that open? Good? Getting there, okay. Okay, um, I'll keep moving through this and uh, if you can work on it as I explain the first steps. So the, the first set ba cell basically installs Chainer, CuPy, and NumPy. Um, and it has, uh, this stuff is a little bit noisy. Uh, basically, the collab is a very particular environment, and we had to do a little bit of shoehorning to get Chainer to run on it. Uh, when you're installing Chainer on your own uh, Mac OS or Linux or other uh, system, it probably will just be pip install Chainer, pip install Kupai, and then it should be OK. But we needed to do some special libraries that were not available um, within the collab environment. And so when you run this, you'll see it go through uh, a bunch of stuff as it's loading in the various components. And I encourage you to go ahead and, and continue going with that um, to get the print runtime info. This is Chainer version 4.4 and Kupai version 4.4. And then we're going to start talking about the data set. So uh, how many people here have used MNIST? Know what MNIST is? Yeah, we're not going to use that. <laughs> uh, MNIST is 20 years old now. Uh, it, was, uh, invent it was first put together by Yen C. LeCun. And it's, uh, it's a little dated. Um, most, uh, most training can get about 98 or 99% on that. And it's really hard to make a significant improvement on that. So uh, last year, uh, Zalando, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the uh, German uh, online sales company, made a different data set that's called Fashion MNIST. So this is a drop-in replacement for MNIST. Um, here's one of the pictures from it. This is a t-shirt top. They have uh, 10 different categories, basically, of clothes. They have ankle boots, shoes, pullovers. Um, OK, well, t-shirts, tops, trousers, pullovers, dresses, coats, sandals, shirts, sneakers, bags, and ankle boots. So this is a more challenging data set than MNIST. 
Uh, those of you who are familiar with MNIST, it's, it's basically just the numbers from zero to, from zero to, the, or one to 10, 10 being zero. And they're mostly just black and white. You see they're black outside of the letter and white on the letter. So it's fairly simple to learn. Whereas uh, the Fashion MNIST data set, which you can use as a, as a straight drop-in, you just import Fashion MNIST instead of MNIST, um, basically gives you pictures like this that's more challenging and interesting to study. So uh, this first uh, page here is just basically going over loading in the data. So uh, we import Fashion MNIST, um, then we download the data. This step will take a little bit of time. The good news is that it's not happening here. This is all happening in the magical uh, data centers of Google offsite. So uh, it's not blocking up our data coils, which is one of the reasons why I decided to use Google Colab. Uh, we'll load in mat mat plot libs so we can do some pictures like you see over there to the left. Um, and then we just pick out one particular sample from uh, Fashion MNIST, the first one, just to give us an example and start looking at the data. I think it's really a good idea to get familiar with the structure of your data as you're going through these things. Sometimes it can seem sort of magical when you load in a library and you don't actually know what it looks like and feels like. So in that fashion, the first thing to do is just print the shape of um, this particular, uh, of the training example. So you can see the shape of train, it has 50,000 examples, and the other dimension is two. So one of them is going to be the actual black and white picture, and the other one is going to be the zero to nine value for which of the labels it represents. And then we print the shape of X, which is uh, one of our very first little uh, first uh, data points. So X, as you can see, is basically a 784 uh, unit long vector. Anyone know what the number 784 is for? Why is it 784 long? Close, 28 by 28. <laughs> right, so it's uh, 28 by 28 square. So the data is just right in a line. Uh, no, the, the, it's a, the dimension. So the, the training set is um, 50,000 examples. Okay. And each example, the first part of the example is the actual features. Okay. And the second one is the answer of what it is, which is a 0 to 9 number. OK? OK? And then just to give you an idea of what the inside of X itself looks like, we printed some raw X. So you can see that these are, um, as opposed to 0 to 256 numbers, they're 0 to 1 numbers. They're just normalized so that it's easier to go through the data and give you a, a straightforward color value, a grayscale value. And uh, then to show you what the picture looks like, we did the uh, plot image show and reshaped it in 28 by 28 so we had the right dimensions and showed what it looked like and then printed the label. And to get the label, we took um, the actual answer, which is T from train and put it inside of the labels um, thing, the labels array to get the label of it and that's a t-shirt top. Okay, is everyone good to this point? Okay, good. Question time. All right, so uh, just pick out another example. Take a look at the data. So um, change the, uh, the example above um, to pick out a separate item from out of that data. Uh, take some different samples of the raw X to see what the, they look like. See where you can see the white spots and the black spots. And uh, then if you're still looking for things to do, try flipping an image upside down or rotating it, doing some data augmentation. If anyone has any questions or problems or anything, just let me know. How do I get the yeah. Okay, so you don't have to change the look at the bottom of the screen. There's the, the new URL. Uh, okay.
okay. Other questions? Yes. You didn't learn it before you came? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that was a joke. You're fine. Um, for those two choices, so the, ch the question is whether Chainer is, a, uh, is something for designing things with, for fast failure, or whether it's a production tool. Um, out of those two, I would say that Chainer is, uh, is made for researchers. That's th what we use it for. Um, so our intent is to make it as friendly as possible for customization. Um, we're continually working on coming up with the newest models and, and moving them into Chainer. So we definitely want it to be faster for that. Um, for production, some other applications are going to be, we're working on for cons ex export, exporting into Onyx and some other things that make it faster. Also, we've just published a C program called Menno, which has become quite popular, which is another way to do quick inferencing on the production side. Okay? Okay. So, uh, next, let's talk about the iterator. So we have our data set now, and you have an idea for what the data is inside of the data set. And the iterator basically, um, what it does is it takes your data, and then it makes batches out of it to pass over to the next part of the program. So um, the data is too large, as you saw, we have 50,000 examples. You can't load it all into memory at the same time. But also, you wouldn't want to do just one at a time, because then it will take you too long to do the processing. And you won't get the benefit of your GPU to help you with the speed. So you have to find an appropriate batch size. Uh, I think uh, 128 is a good size for this kind of an effort. And then we uh, set up three different iterators. So we have an iterator for the actual training, the validation, and the testing. So um, this is actually an important point. Um, earlier today, uh, we heard Gail talking about the issues with folding and how you could change your data so that you might be getting a false answer because you can make the bins whatever size you wanted to make them. Uh, in deep learning, usually we're making a training batch, and then we have a separate batch for testing. Uh, what people sometimes don't remember to do is that you should have a third batch, which is the validation batch. Because when you're tuning your hyperparameters, if you're tuning your hyperparameters and, ver and verifying their performance against your test batch, basically you're overfitting your test batch. So you need another batch, the validation iteration set that then you use when you're tuning your hyperparameters, your network architecture, and other things. And then only when you're ready to go, you want to find out final answer. You're not going to do it again, I swear. That's the only time that you would test against the test batch. So we set up three separate um, iterators, so that we have one iterator, which is going to be for the training, and one iterator, which is then going to take in the, the um, for validation, and one for test. And uh, we make them so that uh, for the training, it's OK to repeat and shuffle so that it gets different things. But for the validation and the test iteration, basically it's going to run through the whole thing. And they're already shuffled, so it's OK. Yes? Is that for equal sizes? Not for equal sizes. Um, the majority is still, let's see here. Yeah, I think I skipped over this part a little bit fast. Um, the majority is still going to be within uh, the training, or the training. So we have 50,000 in the training, and then we have 10,000 uh, within the um, test and 10,000 within the validation. I'm not positive about those numbers, but the majority you still want to use for your, your testing, or your training, excuse me, and then take the rest of it. And there's no hard and fast rule for that. That's um, something that's done sort of depending on the particular set. Oh, repeat mean that you could use the same example again. again. So in the training, we're, for the training set, we're going to continually go through the training. So this means you only iterate over it once. It just protects you from not accidentally iterating right. against that new iterator. Right. 
you would you wouldn't want to get a better result because you tested some examples in your validation set twice. Yeah, and the default. Why would what, what did the shuffle fault? I mean, I understand conceptually what it does, but why would you care whether it was shuffled or not? Uh, sometimes your data set might be ordered. Yes. And in that case, it um, especially if you did. Um, it, it might give it a different answer then depending on how much of it did. Yeah, so validation and testing. I see, so that way you, put, you, you keep it in the same order so you don't change it back. That's right. The idea. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, say you wanted to do uh, table um, on the data, would you just build a iterator for every poll then? Um, you, you, can re, you can reuse them. Um, I haven't uh, done KFOL before. I think we might actually have some fold iterators that are specialized for that. Um, but that's not something that I've done. <laughs> <laughs> might be something we'd welcome contribution for. <laughs> um, but that would be the way that I think you'd want to go about it. Is there a reason, like, I mean, why do people don't use the stateful? Because, like, we noticed that in, in Ethereum, people don't do KFOL. Wow, I think that's out of the scope of what I can answer. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I, know, I just know historically you're right. And I, I think actually, honestly, I think KFOLD is a better approach. So I, I have the same question, actually. <laughs> I think it depends on the amount of data. So if you are using like millions of tens of right. examples, then it makes total sense to use KFOLD. Right. So if you have a 1,000 examples, it's fairly simple to do to mix that up every time. But I think, I think you're on, probably correct. Large data set. Basically, you have to build an independent model for each one, so you have to build instead of one model to build ten. If you do a tenfold spread. Okay, but the width of the binomial was ten thousand, and the computer was at two percent. So it's ten thousand sets back. If you get a two percent increase, it it might be just chance. It might not generalize. So yes, it's expensive. <laughs> 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 I think if we can uh, <laughs> take that one maybe to uh, book it tonight or something. <laughs> okay. So um, next let's go over to the model side. So um, this is a beautiful picture of a neural net. I think most of you have probably already seen this kind of picture before. Um, for those of you who are not as familiar with neural networks, so um, this is the input layer. So in our particular example for um, Fashion MNIST, how many nodes do we have on the input layer? Right, right. So we would have, uh, it didn't fit on the paper. And if I put it there, no one would have understood what the picture was. Uh, we would have actually 784 individual nodes, which is the input from the, the uh, vector that goes in. And uh, we'll go through the, the hidden layers, the latent layers afterwards. And uh, how many output layers, uh, how many output nodes do you have? Nine? Ten. Ten. Right. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have zero as well. Um, and then changing the configuration within that is something that uh, I'll invite you to play with later. Any, any questions about like kind of net neural network stuff? I'm going over this kind of quickly, but this isn't really the focus, so. OK. OK. So uh, furthermore. <coughs> So this is a, a screenshot directly from the Chainer documentation. I wanted to include this as well, um, just to sort of show that uh, the documentation also explains how these things go through. Um, this is using uh, sequential, which makes it uh, sequential functions, which makes it easier to set up uh, our neural networks, makes it read, I think, much nicer, as you'll see. Um, I think some of you might be familiar. I think there are similar implementations in some other frameworks. Uh, it enables you to set up uh, a network fairly simply. You can just say that, look, we're going to have 10 nodes feeding out to 10 nodes. And the connect, the function, the activation function is going to be a ReLU. Do people know what a ReLU function, activation function is? Right. OK. So I'll use my artistic skills in this whiteboard to draw a ReLU. Here we go. So basically, it's just a function that if the, the value is less than uh, 0, it gives you the value of 0. And if it's greater than 0, it's linear off of there. 
So it's a, a simple activation function. There are a lot of activation functions. Uh, there's uh, sigmoid activation functions and tan H and other things that all can be used. Um, uh, just using Rallo for this one for basics. This one here has a sigmoid then for the next layer. And then uh, to make the, the composite model, it just takes the two sequential models and chains them together. And I'll go over this again when we actually get to the code so you can see how it fits in our particular case. And also you can take layers once you've made them and just repeat them. So it's very easy then to, to if once you have like, okay, we're going to have a hidden layer with this many nodes connected by relus, you can just repeat it each time. So it makes for very concise code. And uh, you can also add uh, your own functions or callable functions within that. So you can put your own functions as you want to uh, define them as well. So that's the, the documentation on it. Let's look at how it looks in the code. So first we're going to import uh, the chainer functions as f and the chainer length as l. And then we're going to define our uh, MLP. MLP is a multi-layer perception. It's based perceptron. It's basically just saying that all of the layers are going to be fully connected. At this point, we're not doing any CNNs or RNNs or anything uh, more tricky. Okay. And then uh, within the MLP, so the first layer is going to be the, using the sequential, and it's going to be using uh, the L linear uh, and 100 nodes. So the, uh, the first layer is going to have 100 nodes and then be connected by ReLU activation function. And then we repeat that twice. So we have two hidden layers uh, with 100 nodes. And then onto that, we append that last layer with the 10 nodes on it. So one thing you might notice here, by the way, is that uh, if there's only one number, it just assumes that the other layer coming in is fully identified. So this saves us from having to write the first linear layer is 784, comma 100, 100, comma 100, 100, comma 100, and then 100, comma 10. So it, it's more concise, and if you just put one unit in, it says how, how many that is and assumes that makes it appropriate for however many coming in automatically. And then we return this model. So this is our definition of the model, and then we make an instance of it. And then to, we want to do a little bit of checking just so we can see what it looks like. So we flatten out the model, because otherwise the repeat will, will read as a repeat. We would like to see actually what it has repeated so that we're sure that we've got what we want. And then uh, for the loss itself, we put on a classifier model. Um, you could also use a, a cross entropy if this was a, a one case. There are some different um, losses that you can use. In this case, since we have set 10 separate instances, we're just going to use a standard classifier. And then these last lines basically decide whether the calculation is going to be used on the GPU or whether it's going to be used on the CPU. Um, while I've been using GPU quite a bit, uh, Chainer can do the calculation on a CPU as well. Uh, it's just not going to be fast if you're doing heavy training. Okay, any uh, questions about the model? Uh, as it's going through, it's getting this in order. So it has the feature, like it has the features when it comes in, and that's how it knows. It reads it. It uh, it's being read live each time it goes through. So when it gets 784 and then sees the next layer is 100, it just makes the links. No. That's one of the benefits of having it filling out at runtime. It can say okay. This is what's coming in. This is what I use. Which classifier do you use? Um, this is a, I think this is actually cross entropy. I can't remember. It's a, the default, and I can't remember what it is right now. <laughs> so um, I wanted to show you this. Um, this is also from the documentation again, as you can see for Chainer. Um, this is the more classic way of defining a, a neural network. Chainer supports this as well. And uh, for some things, it might be required. If you're doing really fancy things where you're changing the network architecture as it runs through, or you're doing looping back or other things, uh, you might need to use this kind of a, a network. Or if you wanted to put things that are printing out as it's actually running through. So uh, people who are using PyTorch might find this to be very familiar. Um, uh, PyTorch is a fork of Chainer. Uh, so they, they copied that. Um, and uh, the here you can see, again, we have the none in this form, and then it goes to n mid units. It's 
kind of the same thing. I, I just wanted to show it in case this is what you see when you see chain or code and say, think it doesn't look like what I showed you. This also exists and can be helpful. So the next thing that you need is now that you have a model, now we need to use that model and put it inside an optimizer. So the optimizer is uh, basically going to be using the, is each time you go through an iteration, it's going to be telling you how good your answer was or whether you need to tune your answer to something else or to improve it. And in this case, uh, you can see basically it's pretty simple to put the, um, the model inside of an optimizer. So out of the optimizer, just chose as the optimizer, uh, chainer optimizers. I just use Atom. I think that's a generally a better choice these days than stochastic gradient descent. But you could use stochastic gradient descent as well, SGD. Uh, if you look at uh, the documentation, it'll show you that there's a lot of uh, defaults for all of these things. There's a, a learning rate and other things that you can set if you want to. But the default usually is fairly reliable for these things. OK. And then we get to the updater. So the updater then is going to connect the, uh, the iterator and the optimizer together. And again, this is a fairly straightforward one line to connect the two into an updater. Uh, the standard updater here, there are, there are some other updaters that could be used, like a parallel updater if you're using um, multiple GPUs or even uh, multiple nodes. In other words, you have multiple servers and you're using them together. Chainer is very strong on using uh, multiple nodes. As I mentioned, with the 1,024 GPUs, we had to do a lot of work on Chainer. And it does that pretty much out of the box. Well, actually, we have a, a module called Chainer MN, multi-node, that does that stuff. OK. And then we get into the extensions. And then all of these things are going to be put together into the trainer itself. So here's our, our trainer. And uh, we have the, um, the updater then goes into the uh, trainer, as well as the extensions, which I'm defining here. So we have the evaluator. So here we're using the, the valid iterator. Uh, again, we, we're putting the test iterator aside. That'll only be used once we're sure we have our final answer. And uh, we have our model loss, which is the classifier. And we're using our device and the GPU. Uh, we get another picture of the graph here. So this will give us a, a picture of how the actual network architecture looks as it runs through it. Uh, a log report, which will give us the data. Um, then we'll plot some reports so we can see what the, what the performance looks like, see what the accuracy looks like, um, make sure whether they're overfitting or, or underfitting, and see how that's going. And also, we'll print out a report so we can see how the training goes as it's done. OK? Um, and then we go ahead and go trainer run, and we run it. Uh, so have, have people followed along and, and executed this as we've gone through it? OK, and you see now chugging through. And you can see that your, the things that uh, you look at here is to see how your, your losses um, look at the accuracy, usually. So you can see you started about 80% accuracy. And this time, it was even actually higher on the validation. And you can see that the accuracy slowly goes up, but the validation set not quite as high. And you can see how the speed is going in that as well. So and then this is, the, uh, this is the dump log. So you can see what the actual structure looks like. We saw before a setting of a little right under the sequential to see what the network structure looks like. And this is a more defined version of it. So you have your bias with 100 units. Uh, you have um, the actual uh, images themselves. And then also you have your weights. And those go into a linear function, uh, which goes down into the ReLU. And then it goes in your, your, into your new uh, set, which is now you're incoming into another ReLU with a new bias and new weights. And these things can be in different order depending on the runtime, which then goes through another ReLU, which then goes through another linear function. And then we have our softmax cross entropy. OK, and there's what our classifier is. Now we know. Uh, which then goes out to our label. <coughs> it's kind of hard to see. I hope you, you can see it better on your local PC. And other things that we have is here's our loss. Uh, you can see that uh, clearly here um, we're uh, underfitting. So we're not able to, uh, do I have that right, the underfitting? No, we're overfitting, excuse me. So we're overfitting here. So the main loss is going down, but we're not able to improve the validation that much. So this is a, a basic fully connected neural network. Um, to do other things, you could try putting more layers in things. Well, let's, here's the, um, the accuracy chart. So you can see that we're continuing and uh, over, uh, overfitting on the main. 
And so here's some things to try. So now you have a working neural network. See what you can do to improve it. You had a question? Um, so that is the uh, ID. So by standard, uh, on a computer that has one GPU, the ID of that GPU is zero. If you have four GPUs, it'll be zero, one, two, three. So all that's saying is that just use the first GPU. And the Google Colab notes, they only give you one GPU. Is that OK? Yes? be the difference um, honestly there shouldn't really be one um, there's some there might be some differences in the code that might change the accuracy and other things but um, the architecture given the same architecture and the same data and the same optimizer and the same batch size the math is pretty well known uh, that said the devil can be in the details and sometimes the accuracy of some frameworks can be slightly more or slightly less um, yeah, so it basically, and there, there's ways that you can actually export them to the same structure. So I mentioned Onyx before. That's uh, coming up as a new way to standardize between frameworks so that you can export to one standard system. And that's doing just what you said, basically, so that then you could have a network trained by Chainer or by PyTorch or by TensorFlow, and you would be able to output them to one inference machine. They would be able to use them all the same way. Next question, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, it, it can be used on, on anything. Uh, you have to have software that can handle it. Um, but a Raspberry Pi, it's going to be kind of difficult. Actually, I've, uh, there's someone in Japan who actually does real-time inference with a little video camera on a Raspberry Pi. But he has custom code that he's used to actually access the GPU on the Raspberry Pi, <laughs> <laughs> which is not an NVIDIA chip. <laughs> um, so it can be run on anything. Um, so here's some, some things to, uh, to try to see whether you can improve the performance of the network. Uh, you can change the number of epochs so you give it more learning time. Uh, change the batch size so that it has a, a faster time. Change the number of nodes or layers. You saw the sequential ones there. Um, use a different optimizer or add optimizer arguments. You might, you'd have to look at maybe Chainer Docs to see what, you, what they're called. Um, change to a different activation function. Uh, or add regularization, like uh, a dropout or a batch normalization. So go ahead and try those, and if uh, you have a question, uh, raise your hand, let me know.
Okay, I think we'll um, uh, continue on. Uh, so one thing, uh, what at least one person noticed is that um, sometimes when you reload the, the page, uh, Google, uh, you'll notice that Coupi version is none, meaning it wasn't able to load Coupi. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, when one IP address, this is my theory, uses a whole bunch of GPUs, sometimes Google thinks that we're farming Bitcoin <laughs> and stops allocating GPUs to those instances. So in that case, you can uh, just not load Coupi, and you can change the GPU ID from zero to negative one, and then it will run on the CPU. In this case, it's it's still doable uh, time-wise. If we had a much something much more heavy, we would feel that a lot more uh, keenly. But it's okay. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, the last uh, one, which is the dropout. And we had a question of how to do this, actually, because it, it's a little trickier than some of the other kinds of changes. Um, in order to use dropout, we have to tell it what dropout ratio we want to use. And so we they have to use a partial function. So this requires us to bring in something a little bit more funky, and that we have to use function tools and import a partial function from that so that we can pass it into the network. Okay, so this is doing a, a dropout ratio of uh, 30%, basically. And you can just append that after the, uh, each layer. And so in this way, you have to, uh, I wasn't able to use the repeat anymore because you have to be careful that you're not doing any dropout before the last layer. Because there's no way that your network can guess the right answer if it's getting zero input on the last layer. So um, when I put in the dropout, uh, basically, you have to put it just between each of the layers. And so we have one dropout layer here and another dropout layer here. And the other parts of it is basically just um, adding on to the model. So uh, I hope it was fairly clear how to play around with the models and, and repeat layers and add things together. Um, it, uh, it's quite a bit simpler and much more concise code. And uh, once you get used to it, it's quite uh, intuitive. Any, any questions or comments about that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You you could also put it here at the end of it, but then it'd be too long, and I'd have to. You know. <laughs> yes. Sure. Um, this is just done like however you want to read it. Basically, is however you think about it. Okay. So um, now that we've gone through the, the basic uh, training of our model, um, what was the accuracy? What was the best accuracy people got? Or what did you notice as you changed like, the number of layers or the number of nodes? Or Anyone ha have any comments about how it went? Or did, did it didn't, didn't run or didn't change? Or didn't get there. Oh. Did you have a, an issue or? or Just too small. I was reading uh, on, on I see. Okay. Too, too slow. Okay. Yeah. The the I mean, GPU. Right. Yeah. We were talking actually. It, it it also seems that the Google GPUs they give you are somewhat variable in performance. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some people might be lucky. Some people not might not be. So um, so we talked before about how we had the test evaluator and we haven't touched it yet because we've been doing our tuning. We've been changing maybe hyperparameters or the, the neural architecture structure. And uh, so I wanted to show you once, of course, we've done that. And we have what we think is our final answer. This is our best network. And technically, you'd want this to be done by someone else. But this is how you would then take your test evaluator to find out what your test accuracy is. So this is what actually the answer is against the holdout data set that you haven't touched yet at this point. So basically, you just use the, uh, the evaluator again, uh, and use your test iteration uh, with your model loss. And uh, you make a re results equal to uh, that function, and print it, and there you go. So uh, we had the question before about, OK, well, is this a general network architecture? How does this work? How can I use this for inference or other things? So uh, the saving of models is done with serializers. And this allows you basically to take all the learned weights. So you've spent the time, you've paid for your GPUs or whatever, and you've trained a model, and it's giving you the accuracy that you want. Or maybe you're halfway there, but you've got to stop or do something else. 
So this is how you basically can save uh, a particular model that you've trained so that then you can recall it later or so that you can use it for inference to actually give you an answer at a later time. So you import, uh, again from Chainer, you import serializers. And uh, you save uh, NPZ. This is a NumPy format. That's what the NPZ stands for. Um, and just give it a name. And you save your model under NPZ. And then it will take all of the parameters, the weights and the biases, and uh, we'll save them into that serializer. And then you just check and make sure, yes, that file is actually there. Okay. So then the next thing is to uh, get the inference of, for the evaluation to see if it's the same as the previous model. Oh, sorry. Uh, to make the, uh, you have to use your basically your previous model structure. So in this particular case, I, I, I remember right, this is all basically in the same collab. So you already have your uh, MLP definition up above. If this was a separate program, you'd have to give it that definition of the network again. So we make our inference model equal to our, uh, an instance of our multilayer perceptron. And now we're just going to load uh, from the serializers NPC that same model into the inference model. And again, we have to set the GPU to the appropriate thing. And uh, we get a test image and label it. So in this case, I've just taken the very first instance out of this test label. Uh, and again, we've, uh, this is just showing you what that data looks like. So in our test data set, the first image is actually a ankle boot. And uh, the ground truth of it is that it's an ankle boot. But we have to uh, set this up to be doing the inference. So, uh, sometimes you'll have to move things back and forth between the GPU and the CPU. So Chainer CUDA has those functions, two GPU and two CPU when necessary. And we want to be able to uh, use a mini batch to do this inferencing. If you have just one instance that you're testing, it's easy to pass in one instance. But many times you'll have a bunch of things that you need to pass in. So it's best to just make it use um, an array of uh, examples as opposed to a single one. Um, so if we're on the, uh, the GPU, we're going to send that data to the GPU. Uh, and then we're going to do the uh, forward calculation of it uh, using the um, training false. So we want to make sure that we're not going to be changing the parameters when we're doing our inferencing. Right? So since we're doing our inferencing, if we don't, put train, if we don't use the uh, configuration train false, it could change the weights and biases. So maybe we would get a different answer some other time, depending on how many inferences we've done. And uh, the result is a variable. It's under the Y data. Uh, we send it to the, the CPU uh, so that we can use standard NumPy with it. Um, we, get the, uh, we round it off and print the value. And then find out what the uh, arg max is to see what the uh, best answer is. And then we can see what our actual uh, <laughs> prediction is for this. So is this fairly clear? It's, it's kind of straightforward stuff. This is. Honestly, I, I spend a lot less time here than I do trying to fidget with hyperparameters. Um, but this is uh, also a key part. And it uh, can be done basically with uh, other systems as well, assuming it's able to handle the same sort of MPZ. So uh, what things can you do from here? Uh, so I, I hope today you've gotten a good look at uh, both uh, Chainer and Kupai. You have an idea of uh, maybe a review of how the pieces and parts of a neural network fit together so that you see how they, they come together to work. Um, and uh, hopefully you've seen some of the benefits of Chainer, of how it can make it fairly simple, pretty simple to work through the various parts and to build a neural network, uh, train that neural network, which is automated, and then do inference using those parts. So uh, Chainer is very strong on the cloud. Uh, we met, I mentioned below, there are a couple of sibling packages that we have. So we have Chainer CV, uh, which offers additional uh, computer vision uh, models. It allows imports from CAFE and has some more specialized functions and methods for doing data augmentation, which is very typical when you're using pictures and things to shift them around, flip them, and other stuff. Uh, we have reinforcement learning chain RL, which is then going to specialize in PPO and uh, reinforcement learning type of training. And Chainer MN, which is then built uh, to do multiple uh, nodes, really. So that's going to, if you're in a data center and other things, it can get you the answer much faster. 
So the Chainer MN is something that in particular Chainer excels at. Um, we've been working very closely with uh, AWS. Uh, and this last year, actually in June, they announced that Chainer is supported as a first class citizen on uh, SageMaker. So it's TensorFlow and Chainer, actually. Uh, and can be run there so you can use uh, cloud resources so that you can p greatly parallelize your computing. So for pretty much the same cost, you can get your answer back in a fraction of the time. So uh, the cloud infrastructure has a lot of benefits to it. We also work very closely with Microsoft on Azure as well. Um, we're starting to have conversations with Google. Um, so it's uh, a good way to practice. We've all been using Colab during this session. So you can see that it can be quite easy to use that if you don't have a GPU of your own. I'm still waiting for their uh, Macs to get NVIDIA or uh, to support some other GPUs, but we're not there yet. And uh, since this is uh, Euro SciPy, also, if you uh, find something wrong or if you think that um, we should make an iterator for uh, Enfold or something and you'd like to submit a PR for that, <laughs> very welcome. Uh, we're very active uh, in, uh, I'm not sure, shepherding and in, in working with the community to make sure that pull requests are looked at and issues are addressed. Uh, we have a Slack. Let's see, I think that's the next one. Uh, we have the docs.chainer.org, which I see uh, many of you have been looking at uh, as you looked up things during the session. Uh, also, um, we have uh, Stack Overflow has quite a bit of things on them. And uh, we also have a Chainer Slack that's available as well. Okay. So uh, that brings me to the end of the session. I'm going to let you out here a little bit early because, you know, it's the last session on Wednesday of uh, the day. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be up here for a little bit longer. So thank you for coming. very close in performance. Um, they're, uh, pretty much all the frameworks now are currently bottlenecked at the GPU. So uh, despite uh, PyTorch having more uh, uh, C language, C++, C++ and the Lua behind it, still the, the bottleneck is basically the CUDA and the NVIDIA drivers. So um, there's some benchmarks that are done by Il Carmen, who's an employee of Microsoft, that compare the various frameworks, TensorFlow, um, MX, NAT, CNTK, PyTorch, all of them. And Chainer is right up there in, in the midst of all of them. And uh, we used Chainer for that benchmark that we did where we did uh, ResNet in 15 minutes using 1,024 GPUs. So it's not, it's not the, the front end at this point that's the bottleneck. It's still the GPU. So Chainer is competitive. Yes? Yes. So could you give a few examples where uh, it stands out that uh, the Chainer is full Python and PyTorch, not everything is Python? Py PyTorch, if you just go to the Google, rep the GitHub repository, it has like the languages that are contained. You have to do like a click on something. So it's 30% Python. Yes. It, it, it makes a difference then if you try to go deeper into the language. So um, if you're doing basically just uh, straightforward boilerplate stuff, you might not notice the difference. But um, if you go deep into PyTorch, you'll start to hit Lua code and other kinds of code that are more difficult to work with. And if you're not familiar with Lua, I'm not. <laughs> Yeah. So Chainer is just a Python function. It's just a Python function, exactly. I can't, I can't answer that for PyTorch. Yeah. Maybe not, but yeah. But for Chainer, I know it will just be a Python function. Okay. Sure. Yes? No, you can just do, like, it depends. If you want to use it for your script, you can just do a Python function and have that as a log function and just mm -hmm. 
support that's a bit more and more um, and put that into your blog. But if you want to actually contribute it to PyTorch, that's of course more involved because it's written in both. Yeah, both might come. It's easier to imagine that for the activation part than the activation part. It should be the same, but I'm not sure. Because, like, in, in I know in Keras I would just use a lambda then, and I uh, use a lambda as, a, as an activation function if I don't want to push it to Keras. And you can do the same in PyTorch with, with like a Keras and uh, no, with, with a lambda layer. Where you basically have a have a short drop in or anonymous function, but yeah, if you if you actually want to contribute to PyTorch, you will probably have to write it in Keras. Or you yeah. yeah. Oh yes, we ha we're very ac we're active in supporting TensorCore. Yes, uh, we have a very good relationship with Nvidia. Uh, we buy a lot of chips from them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we work very closely with them. We also like to buy workflow and some like to buy workflow and Yes. Sorry, could I work with TensorFlow? Mm -hmm. No, TensorFlow. Oh, TensorFlow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yes. Actually, there's a PyTorch branch that uh, uses KuPy for the GPU, which is kind of interesting. Yes? Yeah. Um, is the Chena MN dropping, or is it more involved to actually? It's a, it's a little bit more involved, because you need to use um, NC, uh, NCCL, um, which is the NVIDIA thing to get the, the feeds directly between the GPUs, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are, there's some more tuning for that, but uh, it's one of the uh, better, easier ones to implement because it's real right into the language. Like, um, like TensorFlow has to use like Hodelvode or something, right? Or other frameworks. So it's it's part of the language. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.